U.S. intelligence agencies released an unclassified version of their report on Russian hacking in the last hour. That's the public one. The report says Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered a, quote, influence campaign aimed at the election and that the Kremlin was trying to help Trump's chances by discrediting Hillary Clinton. The cyber operations targeted both parties and sent information obtained from Democratic officials to WikiLeaks. It also says that after the election, Russian intelligence began targeting government employees and people associated with think tanks and NGOs. The public release of the report comes just after top intelligence officials briefed Donald Trump on the hacks. And Trump called the meeting both constructive and praised the intelligence community. But he said the hacking had, quote, absolutely no effect on the outcome of the election. He's promised to appoint a team to report back on how the U.S. can aggressively combat cyber attacks. So will this report lead to action from the incoming president and what can be done to combat cyber attacks? Joining me now from Toronto is Rafael Rosinski. He's a warfare expert and CEO of the SEC Dev Group. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it, Rafael. You're so, welcome. First off, let's start with what do you make of the new information from these declassified report? Well, I think this information is actually quite significant because for the first time we have the U.S. intelligence community coming forward and saying that, yes, in fact, there was an influence act operation that was carried out on behalf of the Russian president that was directed at influencing the elections themselves. What's maybe important to make the distinguishing here is that we're talking about an influence operation, which is the use of information to create influence rather than the hacking itself being the main focus of this release. So... What does that mean to the average person in the United States and Canada? Well, what I think it should mean is, from a big picture, is that, one, we, we now have a, what you might call an, a leveling of the equities. Mm -hmm. You know, for the last 15 years, since the end of the Cold War, we've been used to a kind of a dominance in the, in the global media, where we really didn't see other countries being able to compete in the same way in the global media space. Russia clearly now can and does so both overtly using things like Radio, uh, Russia Today, RT, and its broadcasting, but also covertly through planting information like we see, uh, we've seen disclosed in this report. That latter feature, I think, is the one we should really be worried about. So how worried should we be about it? Well, I think very worried. I mean, what it points is to two things. One is, you know, our societies are open societies. You know, and we put a great deal of trust into formal institutions, whether those are media or the emerging field of social media, sort of citizen journalism being able to narrate the uh, carry of the day. If all of a sudden that starts becoming undermined because of the fact that there's a deliberate campaign to create disinformation, then it really starts to go at the sort of essence of, of, of trust and information in our society. The other aspect of it, I think, is a cybersecurity question. I think Donald Trump wasn't completely out of line in saying that a 14-year-old could have hacked the DNC's email. The fact that anybody could hack the DNC's email, extract information from it, and put it online, I think really goes to the roots of the fact that we are way behind the curve in recognizing the importance, the fundamental importance of cybersecurity to actually the security and safety and stability of our political, economic, and social institutions. So talking about Donald Trump, what do you think of his response now that he's been briefed? Well, I, I think it's the, the, the response that he should be giving. Um, clearly, the intelligence community has spent quite a bit of time putting this case together. The fact that there is a high level of assessment for at least two of the three intelligence agencies, FBI and CIA, as to the fact that uh, this was de deliberate in, uh, influence operations, um, means that uh, you know intelligence agencies exist in order to provide best advice to leaders in terms of what actions should be taken. So certainly in this case, those uh, judgments should be taken very seriously and for the base of some kind of consequent action. So is Trump right to say it's a political witch hunt? I, I don't think so. I think the, the point is, the point that maybe he should be making is the fact that uh, this isn't something that necessarily weighed the election towards him in a fundamental way, especially given the fact that we had the FBI director releasing only three days before the elections or reopening the question of, uh, of whether or not uh, Hillary Clinton's emails contain classified information. You know, whether or not one or the other was more influential, I think, is up in the air. Um, but the point is that this influence operation is something that was designed to meddle in the internal political processes of the U.S. And in that, that's clearly not a witch hunt. So he clearly won the election. We had the college votes uh, out today. It showed that he won. Should he be tougher on Russia and Vladimir Putin when it comes to this now? 
I think it's not just whether or not Donald Trump should be tougher on Russia, but whether or not all of us as part of the international community should recognize that we have an environment, the global information environment, which could be highly volatile to all involved. Let's not forget that a few years ago when Ukraine happened, uh, Putin came out very publicly. Uh, stating that he felt that what occurred in Ukraine was a state-sponsored coup, in part fomented by Western intelligence and media meddling. So the fact that there is a now a reaction, in fact, of what we see in influence operation against the U.S., should not surprise us. The question is, what do we do about it next? Do we simply say that Putin was wrong here and mm -hmm. respond to it in a, in a way that, in effect, puts him on the spot, holds Russia accountable? Or should we recognize that there's a mutual vulnerability here that requires, on one hand, definitely the stick, some consequence, but also perhaps a carrot? In other words, how do we find stability in the international system around an issue that previously wasn't as important as it is now, but now actually is at the center of, of global politics? You put a lot of questions out there. <laughs> I just don't <laughs> even know what the solution would be. What, like, what would it be? Well, I think let's start with the basics. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we have at, at the moment a system around cybersecurity, global cybersecurity, that has not found a norm that fits for everybody. Um, coming up with the equivalent of a global arms treaty in cyberspace, coming up with global norms that we all agree upon in terms of where the interference of state into other state activities should begin or end is probably a starting point. Certainly, I think cooler heads need to prevail here. And the discourse that should be happening between the U.S. and Russia, Canada and Russia, the, G, you know, the, the Five Eyes and, and Russia, China and other countries should be around trying to create what we've created in other areas, whether it's conventional arms or just recently in the environment, some kind of an international convention that allows us to recognize mutual interests, but also exclusive interests of uh, states in these in so space. So really what I'm hearing from you is that a similar situation could happen here in Canada. Absolutely. I think, I think that's absolutely clear, and it can happen for two reasons. One, because we are an open society, which means we trust our institutions and we trust the information within uh, that's generated by those institutions and by citizens, which could be tampered with. And secondly, because our standards of cybersecurity, not just within the political parties, but also within the federal government and within our economy as a whole, are very poor which means that the possibility of being able to breach into our systems through the sort of primitive phishing that really this, this, this hyper hack of the story uh, represented is as possible here as it is anywhere else.